I so love Jamel's diligence here. This is clearly an airport lounge. There is so much to talk about, though, that we had to reach out and get her wherever it is that she was in the world. She could be anywhere in the world because there is so much to talk about. So, Jamel, I'm going to offer you the floor and ask you which of yesterday's topics, sports or otherwise, were the most int- was the most interesting to you. But there's plenty of them, and I don't know which you're going to choose. Okay. Um, I'm thinking about, I'm imagining myself on prices right, right now or some game show. I'm going to pick otherwise. (laughs) Because, because we've got, you've got on the list, Jamel, you've got uh, two gambling stories in sports that are the, are going to be the new normal, whether we realize it or or not, as soon as this uh, all comes under inspection. We have a catastrophe in Baltimore that is heartbreaking to talk about. That is uh, that is uh, the video of which is crushing, and we can all put ourselves in the inside of a calamity in that moment. And it sort of brings a humanity together when you see, when you can all imagine yourself in the same position of oh, life can go that quickly right from under my feet, literally. Uh, and you've got uh, you've got Diddy. You've got Kim Mulkey as well, because the journalism around the Kim Mulkey story to me remains fascinating. And what Kim Mulkey did on the offensive to make sure that whatever comes out next, we're going to shrug our shoulders and say, is that all? When is that all is probably going to be a toxic work culture that allegedly that everyone can condemn unless you file it under. Well, she wins. So which is your choice, Jamel? Which of those would you like? Well, well, damn, Dan, I, I feel like you, you wanted me to pick sports. Fine, Dan, I'll change my mind. I'll pick sports. It's no, awesome. and then I, and, and then, and Caitlin Clark, and then Caitlin yep. Clark. There you go. Okay. And Juju Atkinson. Okay, there we go. Let's, let's do it. Let's go sports. <laughs> well, listen, I mean, it, it was, as you mentioned, a lot going on um, in these last couple of days. And uh, I guess I'll just start with the last thing you mentioned, Kim Mulkey, for example. And th- this is unfortunately a part of, the, the culture that we in right uh, we're in right now um you know every day there's a fight to do good journalism and i feel like that fight has been lost um you know i hate to sound very pessimistic as i often <laughs> i find myself being these days but kim mulkey played from a playbook that has worked it worked for the former president of the united states as well once you label the news media uh the enemy of the state And once you are able to get people distracted from whatever is the information to come, listen, Kent Babb, who is supposedly the journalist who is working on the story, he should be very happy. I don't know if the Washington Post was planning to put the story behind a paywall, but put one that by it now, because now we're all interested. Kim Mulkey basically drew attention to a fire we didn't even know was happening. And a, a lot of people look at this as a strategy to get out front. I think it was a bad strategy because we're more interested than ever in this story. And not to mention, even though she said afterwards that, you know, her team wasn't distracted. I mean, LSU didn't, despite the final score, they didn't play particularly well. I'm not saying that these two things are related, but we get on players all the time and use the word distraction to include everything under the sun. And here you have the coach kind of doing the same thing. Uh, Listen, journalism has lost the overall fight. I mean, misinformation and disinformation is here. And now if you just label everything to be fake or label everything to be true, whether you've seen the evidence or not, that is enough of a seed that is planted in people's mind to already have an opinion about something that they haven't seen. Investigative journalism is hard work. It's practically dead in our industry because it's costly, because there's only a limited number of people who can do it. And then you know, on top of that, it creates a level of, of backlash that a lot of news organizations are no longer comfortable accepting. But do know this, the Washington Post has been at this a very long time. And Kim Mulkey can threaten, her threatening the paper that brought us Watergate, that took down Richard Nixon, is laughable and amusing in itself. I mean, a lot of how Kim Mulkey has behaved has been excused, I think. I mean, I think she's gotten a pretty golden pass um, when you look at the totality of the things that she said and done. And some of that has to do that we're still in this phase right now with women's sports and especially with women's basketball as it's exploding before our very eyes, that there is a protectiveness that is put over this sport because it has been unfairly treated by the NCAA news media organizations have not put a lot of resources into covering women's sports. So what you do get sometimes is this 
need to not just protect it, but to cheerlead for it. And because of that, a lot of the things uh, and toxic traits that we've seen in male sports for a long, long time, they exist on the women's side as well. And they go undercover because frankly, they haven't, uh, a lot of what has been covered in women's sports have, has not been covered with the same level of scrutiny and to the degree that men's sports have. And so Kim Mulkey has frankly gotten a pretty big pass uh, given her level of success. This is not new unique, unique in the sense that we've seen very powerful coaches who are able to win and bring cha uh, championships. They are allowed to be behave as they want to behave as long as they're winning. So I'm very curious. I mean, this could be anything from Kim Mulkey cut somebody off in traffic to massive NCAA violations, to traffic, to toxic culture, as you mentioned, I have no idea, but I know that I'm interested now, uh, but I hate it for our profession that this is once again, shedding a light on what is the state of, of journalism um, at this moment. I mean, you named off a lot of things, gambling. All right, let's do gambling next. I'm currently working well, on a piece no, about that. for No, the hold Atlanta, on, no, hold so. on, hold on. We've got, I <laughs> want to get all of this with you, uh, but I have, okay. I have some journalism questions as well. Okay. Uh, but, but you hijacked the show. Okay, my bad. Sorry. Stop. Yes, she deserves a hot no. jacket. Stop show. that gambling conversation. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. It would be my great bad. if this whole thing was over like a traffic violation or she cut someone off, right? Yeah. She's just like so upset that they've like interviewed so many people about it. Remember, Dan, you're implicated <laughs> in normalizing sports betting across this state. Uh, somebody <laughs> writes in here, is Dan going to be mad at everyone again for not being surprised Kim Mulkey is a POS? Everyone knows. Nobody cares because she wins. Literally the story of every POS sports person ever. I know what POS means. I don't think Billy knows what POS yeah, means. Can you elaborate? Thank you. Piece of shit. Oh, <laughs> piece of shit Jeez. is uh, everyone knows this, Damn. but she wins. Well, I uh, watch Bar Rescue. It means something different. Yes. Have some integrity. Point of service system. Yeah, touch screen. Jamel, the you got seven free ones. <laughs> he, I, I've got it on a loop in my house. I can't stop watching him. He just keeps oh, yelling it's, it's, at the it's, people. It's one of my five favorite shows on TV. Like, in a bucket list of things that I want to do, that I want to accomplish, and however long I have left on this magical earth, I want to be on the recon team for Bar Rescue. I want the beer. I want the food that will probably make me sick and throw up all night. John Taffer, if you're listening, recruit me for the recon team. This is great. I, I got something to run by you. What are your, what's your opinion on bigger balls? Hell yeah. In the NBA, to restrict uh, people from shooting outside, having balls that I, are I just slightly bigger. I didn't know where that was going, because my <laughs> back is early in the morning. I was like, what? Well, it'll <laughs> legislate shots from downtown on its own if you naturally Wait, have a ball let, that's maybe just increased by, me. like, a uh, centimeter. Can I explain to Jamel that we want a new advertising campaign for basketball that fixes everything? Not the games, but the images and the scoring and the problems. And we're saying be hedonistic, bigger balls. Fix games. Yeah. Fix games. Limit uh, threes. Fix games. Okay. Um, <laughs> all righty. Well, <laughs> that took a turn. As they, as they say, I, I was not prepared to have an opinion about um, bigger balls, but I, I'll, I'll lean into you all's expertise because clearly you've thought about this much longer than I have. Uh, good. She wants only areas. These aren't ornaments. These serve a purpose. Yeah. Areas of expertise, because wow. I, I want to get into the thicket, Jamel, so to speak, I, of, of the specifics of how this story comes to be. Because you say investigative work, but this is an enterprise reporter. This is not two years of reporting. This is somebody who's wanted to do this story for two years, but hasn't been working exclusively on it. We've been trying to get the writer on because I want to understand what a little more what Kim Mulkey just did, what the strategy of it was. In today's America, where the playbook for the strategy of what's going to be reported here by an enterprise reporter right now kim mulkey knows because the questions told her she knows we don't know and everything she did the other day was preemptive it was strategic it had more thoughts in it as a defense than anything otani did and what she does by neutering it before it gets started is the reporting has to be so vigorous on are you going to accuse this person of toxic workplace culture, of being cruel and demeaning to human beings? Are you going to accuse her of that? And she can ward it off by saying, 
well, it's just embellishments. I'm telling you on the front end, this is a hit piece when it's not that. That I can assure you of, that it's not gratuitously something meant to harm her. It was somebody who went to report that story, a feature on her life, and then came upon a bunch of things that are probably going to be really uncomfortable about what her workplace is. That's what I would guess. Well, and, and people have to understand this, too, is that when you have fascinating figures, figures in sports, and Dan, when you were at the Miami Herald, you did this many, many times, is that you seek as a journalist to understand why they're so successful. Why have they been able to create um, the winning and the championships and all the things that she's been able to create? So the natural curiosity should be there in explaining who this woman is and how she's risen to power. Now, Lately, and, and and certainly beyond the championships, the reason that Kim Mulkey often is in the news is not usually the best reason. It's not usually the best uh, publicity for her or for her program or for the school. I mean, when you look at the whole season that LSU has had, look at where it started. It started with Angel Reese mysteriously being gone. There being some hints of some kind of discord or some kind of problem happening within the team. Um, we know about... Uh, Kim Mulkey's very frosty, um, you know, attitude toward Brittany Griner, particularly when she was being detained in Russia. You know, there have been all these elements and all these, um, you know, pieces that have been leading us up to who is this woman and how is it that she came to be this way? So that is a very natural question for any journalist to ask. And, and this particular journalist is considered to be one of the best. And Typically, what we shouldn't do when we walk into these situations is write the story in our head or in our mind before we actually do some reporting. And it's possible. It is just what you said, that he started reporting on this story to try to explain this towering figure in women's basketball and came upon something that she clearly finds distasteful based off the questions that she had been asked. Now, as you know, Covering sports as long as you have, uh, Dan, and, and I see my man Greg sit next to you, and I'm sure he could chime in on, on this as well, is that a lot of times these people in sports who are in these positions don't want to be questioned. They don't want anything beyond the narrative that they try to set. And when you come upon or you're able to report and explain a different narrative than what they presented, they get very, very mad about this. So the reaction is not new. It's something that we've seen virtually with anybody who has any prominence in sports. Comrades, real quick, <laughs> how can we have an integrous conversation about journalism when we're dodging questions about bigger balls? Wow. Uh, wow. This is... Uh, I'm going to press you, you on know, these bigger I, balls. You, you have not answered the question. Would bigger balls fix the NBA? I'm sorry, I'm too immature to, to even ask. Well, see, this is, the, J Jamal, this is why he insists on wasting your time when we have. This is not a waste of time. I'm, you haven't heard that anywhere. Just make the ball just a little bit bigger. I'm fixing the game that clearly has an issue. Okay. I'm trying to do right. a serious thing with my journalist friend who knows about. I mean, we haven't your even. Your journalist got... friend is dodging a very simple question. How do you feel about bigger balls in the NBA? So you want so what you want this to be like uh, the carnivals that we go to you know the street carnivals and stuff oh, where no, that's no. how they rig that's how they no, rig it that, right? those they are smaller rims yeah. talking about bigger balls it's a, it's okay, a right. different, different, thing. different thing sorry yeah. different issues more cost different effective things. this sorry. way <laughs> okay I don't want to talk about. I want to have what Mike had. I don't want to talk about <laughs> bigger balls I I do have an epiphany a, I do have a question for you Jamel I think after two years of reporting and a very aggressive press conference by Kim Mulkey. I'm concerned that if what comes out of this is toxic work workplace, that might not be enough for the American public. They're going to go, eh, much ado about nothing. Like, she's the only one who but has that's a toxic how, that's workplace? Wh that's what's brilliant about the strategy, Jamel. I, the, the thing I was mentioning again and again yesterday, and it's a dumb strategy, but it's a brilliant one. If you can neuter all the hard work that you have to do to get all of these accusations vetted so that they're not something that can be proven false and that the person is threatening you with a lawsuit before you ever get started can undermine all of your reporting just by shouting fake news, hit piece, it doesn't. The, the def you cannot defend you can defend yourself very easily against good fact-based journalism that way if it's that unfair of a fight and and Jamel's here to tell you that all over the media the journalism has like 
It's self-inflicted. This wound, this credibility wound is self-inflicted, Jamel. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, I, it, despite the fact, again, that we had a former president who brought fake news to the lexicon and, and really, um, you know, sort of put a, a target on all journalists back with his behavior towards journalists and everything that was ever written negative about him calling it fake news. I agree with it. The reality is that the journalist journalism as a news industry, as an industry period, has been complicit in its own demise. Let's look at what's happening at NBC right now, where they have hired, you know, Ronna McDaniel, who is the former Republican National uh, Committee head, who actively tried to steal an election. Okay, this is not an opinion. This is not, you know, uh, conjecture. We know what she did. You know, and, and she made calls to uh, Michigan uh, election officials to try to get them to not certify the election. And and we know she did this, it is on record. And to platform somebody like that and have the own journalists within your organization rebelling against this hire, it just shows you where you are. Like everybody's boiled everything down to uh, a disagreement or, but we can't have disagreement about facts. That's what we can't do. And unfortunately we are in the age where it's okay to, if the sky is blue and we all see it, for somebody to call us red and then everybody say we should tolerate that opinion just because it's different. It's like, no, that's not how it works. You can't debate and disagree with the facts. You can do great debate and disagree with opinions, with things that are not facts-based, fact-based with feelings, with emotions. You can debate those all day. You can't debate what's in front of you. And uh, the unfortunate part of it, as, as we see this political cycle playing out heading, in, heading into this election, the news media has learned absolutely nothing from how it covered the last two presidential elections. Hasn't learned a thing. They are platforming people who can drive ratings. Most of the major corporations and news, as we know, are run by people who are more interested in what is financially possible or the financial interest of this company. They are not interested in the journalism. The journalism, the who, what, why, where, why of it all is boring now. You have to have this scintillating entertainment that has made political journalism and journalism period feel a lot more, no disrespect, like wrestling as opposed to feeling like something that should matter to people. Like the part of the reason why this democracy works is because we, we have a functioning free press. Well, that functioning free press is on life support right now, not necessarily because it lacks the freedom, it's because they lack the guts and the honesty and the grit that it takes to do this kind of reporting. Journalists aren't supposed to be liked. We all knew that when we got into this job, but we are supposed to tell the truth. And once you eliminate that part of it, along with the accountability, this is why it's okay to platform election deniers. This is why you have coaches in press conferences calling something fake and saying that something shouldn't be listened to or uh, regarded in any light because it somehow paints you in a, in, in a bad light. This is why we have this entire conversation going on in our business. And I, I, I would say I fear it's destroying the business. I feel like we've already lost. It has destroyed the business. Jamel, you said in there, no disrespect wrestling. I know you were saying that to wrestling and wrestling fans, but I thought you were oh, saying... Oh, high horse. I saw her at a WrestleMania once. Wow. It's having a moment. It's cool. I you. was at WrestleMania. It's true. He's, he's not lying. <laughs> Wayne beat Cody's threw, ass last night. At, oh, I threw shade at something. A lot, polite shade. Polite shade. Well, but it was polite. I threw polite but shade I, but, at something but, I attended. But when I, to <laughs> I took it, we were talking about journalism, and I took it as you were saying to us, no disrespect, but to us, the wrestling show that introduces you with its hedonistic bigger balls, that we were playing the part of wrestling. And this is the question I want to ask you. It's a yes or no question, because I want to get to the Diddy stuff. I think you've got uh, valuable insight for us here but this is a yes or no question in and you can only say yes or no in women's basketball are we headed here with Caitlin Clark and the competitiveness of whatever it is this is going to look like against uh, you know uh, white against black because sociology always comes to sports are we looking at a possibility that we get white versus black around Caitlin Clark like Larry Bird and Magic Johnson uh, did to birth the league many years ago as a television spectacle are we going to get the race element of all of this to make an appearance in a way that's going to create real rivalry and storyline yes or no 
before I answer, do we have to cue the friendly neighborhood race lady uh, music or no? <laughs> or can I just answer? No, yes, we'll do that. But Billy has to do that. And he started I- enjoying this story. Okay. You want to ruin it? It's Thank time you. for your friendly neighborhood race lady. And to answer your question, yes, Dan. Okay. Yes, we are getting that. The racial pornography started last year in the championship between I, <laughs> Iowa and LSU. It was just and a yes or no. It was just a yes or no question. <laughs> She's elaborating. Yes. Uh, no, but it was just. <laughs> it requires an elaboration, quite honestly. Thank that, you. That, that's not. I know, but I didn't believe you press her on that and not the bigger balls there. <laughs> okay. Jesus. I didn't want to. Still has an answer. To I didn't want to press the. Bigger she didn't want most balls. people hadn't considered it. Let's stop pressing the bigger balls, uh, Jamel. The Diddy story that captured the Internet. The Internet was meant for that story. And we thought I thought I was watching sort of this is going to be O.J. Simpson, right? Is he going to do what Russell Simmons did? So what what did we see yesterday? All of it, Um, all of it alleged. All of it alleged. Let's just let's throw that big A word out there. Um, You know what we saw for a lot of people, as we've seen, as these figures have continued to fall, um, we saw a. You know, somebody who, for a lot of us who grew up in the age, the the, the heyday of bad boy, um, we saw the crumbling of, of, of something that is been like an institution in, in many ways. You know, this is my early 20s, like just going up in smoke. And I know there's been a lot of that lately. I don't feel sad for Diddy. I don't feel um, I feel empathy for his children, for sure, because that had to be a startling image uh, for a lot of people. And I'm sure certainly for him to see his children in handcuffs. Um, but this is where we are right now. You know, the Diddy is facing a number of very serious allegations that were all played out. Um, you know, most of these have been civil a- allegations. But you knew that at some point the criminal element of this uh, w- would surface. And it, and it has. And. Um, you know, you mentioned Russell Simmons. There have been similar allegations about him. And what you have found is that this art form, you know, hip hop that was created, there is an underbelly of disgust that has existed in this art form for a long time. That doesn't mean the art form didn't serve its purpose. It doesn't mean that it wasn't revolutionary and um, the success that has been there and that has been connected, especially obviously to the black community. That doesn't mean that those things that it has brought uh, to our community go away, but there have, uh, you know, uh, somebody told me this a long time ago. And I remember when they said it, I was just like, ah, that's, you know, I just sort of blew it off, but, uh, but it is true. Your, your, your favorites are probably problematic and uh, they're probably awful. Um, and, you know, it, it's just one of those things that it, while there have been rumors about uh, a Diddy for years, I never thought that this moment would actually come where you would see this man who was responsible for bringing in or taking hip hop to a new height for bringing in the artists that we have loved our whole lives that you would see him essentially in a situation where it almost looks like he's on the run. It was just very surreal, you know, to see. And I know a lot of the chatter, at least among in my group chats uh, with my friends after (laughs) <laughs> so many of the, the memes were shared, not to belie the seriousness of it, but for a lot of us that grew up in that 90s heyday listening to bad boy music or listening to Puffy inspired music, um, it was just kind of like, wow, I just never would have guessed when I was in college bopping to some of this that fast forward 30 years later that uh, this man's reputation would be completely destroyed. I mean, there's to me, regardless of what happens, uh, criminally, there is no coming back for, for Diddy at all. I mean, I, I think the last time we discussed this, I said as much. I think his reputation is permanently destroyed. But if he has done any even a tenth of what he's accused of, I don't really have a problem with it. Right. Seeing him walk around that airport disheveled was my first time seeing the crack in his, his demeanor and his armor. It's like, wow. Like, mm-hmm. He had a, a lot of opportunities to show it earlier, but yesterday I feel like with seeing his children in handcuffs, I feel like the reality of the situation is finally actually setting in, for real. Jamel, uh, we what? have we have less than 30 seconds here. Let, uh, please uh, close it out for us. Well, you know what? You know what else struck me about this situation, too? And it just, again, it's one of those snapshots where you're like, this is where we are in America. Here you have Diddy facing multiple, you know, we don't know what he's facing criminally, but we do know, again, on the civil side, multiple allegations of sexual assault 
a very degrading, dehumanizing behavior, all of that. And then at the same time, we have the leading presidential candidate for the Republican Party who is facing 91 fe felony counts, who has credibly been convicted of, of rape in the case with E. Jean Carroll, who is facing millions of dollars, um, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in legal fees and, and, and payments that he owes for his behavior. And he's running for president. And Diddy's there in Miami circling a building, trying to figure out how his life fell apart. And I just the juxtaposition of that really struck me when I was watching yesterday. I was like, uh, so I guess Diddy should have just been running for president. I know we out of time. You know what I mean? Thank you, Neighborhood Race Lady. But I, I run the social media accounts, so I see all the that hatred that comes your, your way. your friendly Neighborhood Race Lady. <laughs> I see all the hatred that comes your way, and I want to say from the community, we admire you and we love you, sis. So thank you so much for representing us in the right way all the time. I, I appreciate that. Thank you all for having me. And uh, now I'm going to get out of my hostage closet and go catch this flight. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, we appreciate the time, Jamel. Didn't answer. Uh, Keep dodging the tough questions. Didn't though. answer the hard hitting question, though. Never did. Coward journalist. <laughs>